Harvard Divinity School. Psychedelic Spirituality and Indigenous Traditions, February 17th, 2024. Okay, well, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Tinda no. My name is uh, Diana Xochitl Mun. I am Director of Public Programs for the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, and I'm delighted to introduce our next panel on psychedelic spirituality and indigenous traditions. In this session, we will hear from four speakers who will address some of the intersections of psychedelic studies and indigenous spiritualities. We will learn about an Aztec deity thought to have connections to psychoactive plants, get insights into how Buddhism is intersecting with indigeneity in contemporary iterations of psychedelic Buddhism, explore the role of space and environment in psychedelic healing settings, and learn how we might better engage indigenous peoples in political, legal, and regulatory processes pertaining to the use of psychedelics in the United States. I invite you to listen with curiosity and an open mind. And I also encourage you to identify things we ought to be doing differently to better engage and represent indigenous communities. I am moderating this panel, not because I am a scholar of indigenous or psychedelic studies, um, but because I am a member of the Massachusetts diaspora living in the US, and my origin is intricately linked to the psychedelics movement of the 60s. I am 50 years old. Um, my mother, Natividad Estrada, was born in Huautla de Jimenez, Oaxaca, the hometown of Maria Sabina. My father is Henry Munn, an American independent scholar and writer who arrived in Huautla in 1965 to experience mushroom ceremonies, married my mom in 1969, and went on to study and write about Mazatec religion, spirituality, archaeology, and history. My uncle, Alvaro Estrada, documented the oral autobiography of Maria Sabina. Since I was a teen, very young, I participated in Mazatec healing ceremonies involving psilocybin mushrooms under the care of my parents, my grandparents, aunts and uncles, and with the guidance of Chota Chinese Mazatec healers. In this setting, the mushrooms, or tishito, los niños que brotan, are sacred, full stop. Healing sessions begin with the blessing of mushrooms and invocations to God, to Mazatec deities and Christian saints. Healing depends on the grace of these entities and that of our ancestors. The mushrooms themselves speak to us, teach us, and heal us. The sacred and the divine are fundamental in Mazatec ceremonies. At last year's conference, I made a comment about the need for indigenous representation in spaces where psychedelics are being discussed, but there are real barriers to make this happen, and truth be told, some indigenous communities may not even want to be involved, given the long history of colonial extraction and theft, oppression, and marginalization they have experienced. My hope for this session, one which I think is shared by the conference organizers, is that it will be a starting point for further conversations and more importantly, actions. Not only to acknowledge indigenous contributions to our current understanding of psychedelics, but to create mechanisms for benefit sharing as well as collaborative and interdisciplinary learning. Our first speaker is Osiris Gonzalez Romero, member of the Philosophy and Psychedelics Research Group at the University of Exeter, who will start us off by talking about the Aztec deity Xochipilli. Hello, everyone. Kualiteotlac, no toca Osiris y Noe Gonzalez Romero. Noyolo Pajpaki y Pampa Inintonali, Niweltlato y Pan Xochipili. Good afternoon. My name is Osiris Gonzalez uh, Romero, and I'm very glad to uh, share with you this talk about Xochipili. Well, this overview of this presentation, the aim of this presentation is to display a synthetic analysis of the information about Xochipili found in the historical sources. 
This interdisciplinary research requires the implementation of different methodologies, such as iconography of the codices, historiography, and hermeneutics. Xochipilli was considered as the deity of song, poetry, flowers, happiness, games, pleasure, and fertility. Uh, my goal is to highlight this um, aspect because nowadays in the so-called psychedelic renaissance, it's very common to highlight two kind of legitimate uses, the sacred or ceremonial uses and the therapeutic uses of psychedelics. But we tend to overlook a different cultural uses of psychedelics, for example, philosophical uses, political uses, creative uses, and hedonistic uses. The whole debate is trapped between this false dilemma, and due to this, it's very important to highlight, for example, happiness, games, pleasure, and other aspects. The symbolism of Sofchipili, the nobleman who gives flowers, and the use of uh, psychoactive uh, plants will be addressed. It is a divinity revered by the nobles and principals and by the different guilds of artists, such as musicians, singers, and weavers. It is also related to flowers, the rising sun, fertility, and joy. So Chipil is an androgynous deity that in historical sources is characterized in a feminine form and, in, and, and other times in a masculine form. We don't have enough time to go deeper in this uh, issue, but there are different historical sources regarding this topic. The sculpture of Xochipilli was found in Tlalmanalco, very close to the Popocatépetl volcano, and it is one of the most emblematic works of uh, Mexica art sculptures, both for its technical execution and high symbolic content. And part of the uh, discussion uh, section of my paper, it's regarding some uh, framework. For example, in that case, the expression of astonishment is palpable, intensified by the position of the face thrown back and the dip of the gaze. In this case, the essential is ecstasy. We are in the presence of someone who is not looking as we do every day, but is absorbed in the rapturous experience of the sacred trance of the flowery dream, temic such. This is another way to understand the psychedelic experience beyond the frameworks of altered states of consciousness or modified states of consciousness. For example, it's more cultural appropriate to talk about Themic Soch or the flowery dream to characterize the psychedelic or the entogenic experience. Some scholars, uh, the, the another discussion section of uh, my paper, it's some scholars embrace diverse hypotheses regarding the plants and fungi linked with this sculpture. Richard Evan Schultz and Albert Hoffman. Um, point out that the glyphs carved on the body of Xochipilli represent various plants, such as tobacco flower, marigold flower or oleoluki, turbina corimbosa, sinicuiche butum, heimia salicifolia, teonanacatel mosrums, mainly psilocybe astecorum, in Mexico grows 50 species of psilocybe mosrums, the largest amount in the world, poyomatli flower or cacahuasochitl, quarirebea funebris, on the sculpture pedestal is visible a stylized representation of the fungi, Psilocybus decorium, according to Schultz and uh, Hoffman. Anyway, there are mainly hypotheses, and we have to assume that in order to avoid dogmatism. There are six different proposals regarding the iconography attached to this uh, sculpture. This is a proposal that you can find in the uh, um, journal uh, Arqueología Mexicana. And for example, the Sinicuichi uh, Heimia salicifolia, it's um, on the back. The um, Psilocybe astecorum, it's a, a still side flower with the butterfly at the bottom of the uh, sculpture. And there are different uh, uh, plants. Due to this, uh, the title of my presentation is Xochipilli and psychoactive, psychoactive Plants, because some of them are psychedelics. I mean, uh, there are a direct influence on the neuroreceptor 5-HT21 or 2, but another one are psychoactive. What does it mean that they act uh, in a different receptor? Not necessarily the 5-HT21. To T1, that it's 
uh, the neuroreceptor attached to psychedelics. The, the definition of the term psychedelics also has a technical aspect. It's not a, a randomly uh, concept, right? Okay, this is all the, the proposals uh, for uh, the tobacco, Nicotiana tabacum, Oleoluki, Turbina curimbosa, and, and other ones. This is the um, uh, information of uh, Oleoluki and uh, psychedelic plants that you can find in the Florentine Codex in the book uh, nine, compiled by Fray uh, Bernardino de Sagún. And also, for example, you can uh, find the a Spanish um, text in the, in the left uh, column, but also the Nahuatl text. You can find the name, the taxonomical systems, and more important, the therapeutic properties, but also the condemned to ritual and sacred uses in this colonial source. This is the ancient written source to refer uh, psychedelics as a whole in the Western world. To explain more precisely this relationship between plants and music, remember that Xochipilli is the deity of uh, song and dance, of singing, it seems pertinent to take as a reference the research carried out by Abraham Cáceres, who considers that although the interpretation of Robert Gordon Wesson is useful, the truth is that for more especially cited research it is incomplete, because it does not explain the relationship between the plants and flowers found in the sculpture with music. For example, Cáceres has emphasized the role that Oleoluki, whose active principles, ergine and hydroxytilamide, which are of the class of indole alkaloids, contain psychodysleptic properties. That is, they affect auditory perception. And we can talk about auditory synesthesia, not only visual synesthesia, but also with Ololiuki, Sinicuiche, and Teonanacatl are, are related with this auditory synesthesia, and that makes sense that they're related with the god of singing. Right? Robert Gordon Wesson basically, basically followed follow the path of Richard Evan Schultz and didn't add nothing new regarding botanical identification. Nevertheless, nevertheless, his contribution focused on his interpretation of the sculpture. And above all, in highlight the sound synesthesia or sonorous hallucinations attached to Sinequichi, Heimia salicifolia. This is significant to the most studious focus on the iconography aspect of the sculpture of Xochipilli, especially of the different types of flowers and plants carved on the body. But very few have focused on the relationship between music and the plants identified with, with this deity. And this is interesting to highlight because uh, nowadays the word for shaman or maracame in birraritari or which language, uh, the, the translation of maracame, it's the singer, right? This is the, not only the shaman, but more properly the singer. According to Abraham Cáceres' hypothesis, some of these plants whose active principles have psychodysleptic effects, sinicuicho, loluc, and tionanacatl, are symbolically related to singing. Mercedes de la Garza mentioned that many techniques were used to achieve a static trance, some painful and others pressurable. This is important to uh, achieve a better uh, understanding of the rituals, which is the second part of this talk. The rituals related to Xochipilli in order to achieve a better understanding of the cultural context of the use of this psychedelic um, plant. This is another uh, depiction in the Maglavechiano uh, Codex. It's a character uh, eating mushrooms, and behind him it's Michlantecuhtli, the lord of the underworld, the, the lord of the dead. And it's interesting to know how the ritual use of psilocybin mushrooms in Mesoamerica is related with the underworld realities. This is also a common cultural feature uh, shared with the Maya, right, and with the mystic people. These are uh, some of the flowers depicted in the uh, sculpture. The Pisietl is the name in Nahuatl, Nicotiana tabacum. And it's interesting because uh, uh, tobacco uh, or Pisietl uh, was related with, the, um, with some uh, sacred uh, properties against death, for example. The Cacahuasochil, Quariribea funebris, there are psychoactive plants also mentioned in the um, Badiano, de la Cruz Badiano Codex to relieve the, um, the works, the excessive work of the ruling class, 
Uh, also, these psychoactive plants were used by the rulers in order to alleviate the pressure of the government. Uh, Ololuki, which some call Koashiwitl, or snake plant, it's a climbing herb with thin green cordiform leaves. Uh, this is steam green, third long white flowers. The seed is round and very similar to that of cilantro, hence the name in Nahuatl, the term Ololuki means round thing of the plant, and it refers to the seeds. The roots are fibrous and thin. The plant causes four degree borns, helps syphilis, this is important, and mitigates the pain produced by the chills. The seed has some medical uses if it is pulverized or taken as a cooking, or if it is used as a poultice in the head or forehead with milk and chili, it is said to cure eye problems. When you drink, it acts as an aphrodisiac. And it's interesting because Xochipilli was related with the um, venereal diseases. According to the Aztec worldview, was the deity who provoked the venereal disease and also makes sense that all these plants that have therapeutic properties against syphilis, for example, the Oleoluki or Rivea corimbosa, but also Sinicuichi, Anemia, Sassilifolia, uh, have been related with this uh, deity. Now, in our modern society, we tend to focus everything on the psyche, psychedelic, psychoactive, and, and so on. And it's interesting, for example, to notice that mental illnesses in the Aztec worldview are related with the heart. And there is a complete table of mental illnesses or diseases that are related with the heart. It, it's a uh, it's a different uh, cultural feature. Also, uh, to highlight this inconmensurability, uh, the, the word for soul in, 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 in Nahuatl, at least before 16th century, did not exist. Right? And it's interesting to, to think out of the box in order, for example, to think indigenous spirituality without the concept of soul, that it's a key concept in the Western world. The calendarical name of the deity is Macuilzochitl, five flower, and this is a depiction. This is a sacred uh, instrument. It's not for practical purposes. And also, it is possible to see some leaves of Ololuki and a palm head in the, in the face. And to this, it's possible to recognize um, Xochipilli in the codex. I want to close this uh, presentation with the rituals. These are the Ajuyateteo in the Codex Borgia, the gods of pleasure. Xochipilli Macuil Xochitl is the, is the one in the middle, in the period of uh, one flower. There are five uh, periods of uh, 13 days. And also it's highlighted with, a, with, a, with an animal, with a good animal symbol or with a vegetal symbol, the day in which the main feast uh, took place. Right? And um, this is another uh, depiction in the uh, uh, Codex Borbonico. So Chipili is playing uh, the drum with a flower, uh, you know, uh, on, the, on, on the top. And uh, for example, on the rituals consecrated to Sochipili on the fifth day, which was uh, when the first day was celebrated, a man became the likeness of the god, arriving in his clothing in which he danced the beat of the drum and sang for him. Of course, we don't have enough time to explain with detail all this uh, ritual, but of course, uh, in, in, the, in the paper, will be possible to explain with more uh, details. And also, Xochipilli was related with the game, in this case, with the, with the Patoli game. It was a very specific kind of, but also with the ball court of the, or, or the ball uh, game. And um, in, that, in that case, also, it's important uh, to highlight this uh, aspect of the uh, deity. Of course, it's a complex uh, deity, and uh, we need to uh, uh, more time. Anyway, I am going to share this brief uh, synthesis with, with you. Of course, this is a part of a broader research, not only focused on psychedelics, but also in iconography, there is a song of Xochipilli. I made an analysis of the song. Of course, we don't have time to analyze the ritual, the song, the plants, and so on. But anyway, if you are uh, interested, for example, I can share with you all the information that you need.
to go to these historical sources. Thank you very much, and have a good uh, uh, evening. Okay, our next speaker is Colin Simmons, Baker Postdoctoral Fellow of Contemporary Asian Religion at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. He will be discussing approaches for establishing positive engagements with indigeneity in psychedelic Buddhist contexts. And I'm gonna let you sure. do the PowerPoint. Okay, brilliant. Hello everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to Paul, Jeffrey, and all the folks at the Harvard Divinity School for putting on this amazing conference allowing me to share some of my research with this kind of great, interesting group of people. Uh, I know it's, yeah, that low point of the day hormonally, so hopefully it'll be interesting and hopefully my computer battery stays on or else I'm just gonna have to go off the rails and that'll be its own thing. But uh, yeah, so we'll jump into it. So with the history spanning back to the 1950s, psychedelic Buddhism is certainly not a new phenomenon. However, in the last decade, the renewed interest in psychedelics in the general population has spilled over into Buddhist communities where prominent teachers are beginning to incorporate these contemplative technologies into their practice. In these contemporary iterations of psychedelic Buddhism, Buddhism is intersecting with indigeneity in unprecedented and in somewhat complicated ways. So this paper will critically analyze two approaches to psychedelic Buddhism in the work of Mike Crowley and Spring Washam to tease out how these teachers think about talk about and engage with these indigenous communities from which their practices originate. So it'll first outline how each of these teachers approach their practice of psychedelic Buddhism and look at how plant medicines and Buddhist teachings are positioned therein. It will then establish what an ethical reconciliatory approach to psychedelics looks like with reference to the work of Dr. Salidwin and detail the logics of traditional Buddhist authority. Then it will evaluate these two psychedelic Buddhisms in terms of the language they use, how they position indigenous knowledge in their teaching, and the relationship with the indigenous communities that they're a part of. Uh, in doing so, it will identify some of the hurdles that mainstream religious traditions will encounter in the possible integration of plant medicines into their practice, and will hopefully offer a positive model for future syncretic psychedelic religious traditions. So we'll begin by getting acquainted with two of the teachers who will serve as the object of our analysis. Mike Crowley and Spring Washam. Mike Crowley began both practicing Buddhism and psychedelics at the age of 16. He took refuge with Lama Radha Chime Rinpoche in 1970 in Cardiff, and he was given the title of Lama himself by Lama, Chata, uh, Lama Radha Chime Rinpoche uh, in 1988. He founded the American Buddhist community Amrita Dzong, Amrita being this uh, Sanskrit term kind of paralleling with Soma. Um, he's a member of the advisory board of the Psychedelic Sangha, and he's published both a historical book arguing that Buddhists always did psychedelics and a didactic text uh, outlining how a Buddhist might use psychedelics. Crowley thus arrives at his psychedelic Buddhism through a deep conviction in the historical basis of the tradition, and he's actively proselytizing this syncretism to both Buddhist and kind of psychonaut communities. Uh, now, Spring Washam is a Dharma teacher based in the Bay Area of California. Uh, who practices in both Theravada and Tibetan lineages. She's a co-founder of the East Bay Meditation Center, is on the Teachers' Council at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, and was authorized by Jack Cornfield to teach in the lineage of the Insight Meditation Society. She's also worked closely with Peruvian Shipibo communities and the ayahuasca vine since 2008. And in 2014, she spent a full year apprenticing with Shipibo communities uh, and healers in Peru, and she's been leading ayahuasca ceremonies ever since. All of this has culminated in Washam's founding of Lotus Vine Journeys, a syncretic retreat space where Buddhist meditation and ayahuasca ceremonies are practiced as complementary modalities. In her words, Lotus Vine Journeys was born out of a desire to give her Buddhist friends the opportunity to engage with spirit med medicine and has grown into a retreat organization with regular 14-day retreats offered in Costa Rica. So with these two psychedelic Buddhisms very briefly parsed, and we'll go into it more in a moment, uh, we can turn to the analytical frameworks for understanding the relationships with com indigenous communities in both these plant medicine and these indigenous Buddhist contexts. So first, an excellent way of understanding what a reconciliatory approach to psychedelic practice looks like can be found in the article Ethical Principles of Traditional Indigenous Medicine to Guide Western Psychedelic Research and Practice by Uri Uriya Salidwin and all. 
In this article, Dr. Salidwin and her co-authors address the central issue of extractive relationships between white Western psychedelic use and indigenous plant medicine communities by offering concrete solutions to these extractive methodologies by turning to indigenous principles. And you can see on this table for these uh, indigenous principles, these problems in psychedelic practice and the solutions they offer. Uh, but I'd like to focus this discussion on only some of these solutions, solutions as they pertain to our discussion on psychedelic Buddhism. So Salidwin and all write that an ethical psychedelic practice will encourage therapies based on indigenous wisdom to one, reorient practitioners towards positive relationships with the more than human world. It will acknowledge the indigenous source of their practice. It will promote an inclusive and respectful practice. It will make an effort to highlight indigenous intellectuals and teachers in the promotion of psychedelic practice. It will prioritize indigenous sources of authority regarding their practice. And finally, it will include indigenous scholars knowledge holders and practitioners in the development and the dissemination of this psychedelic practice. Uh, now, likewise, the Buddhist tradition has its own set of principles for recognizing religious authority and legitimizing both teachers and practices. Across Buddhist traditions, lineage forms the foundation of religious authority. In order to teach, you must be granted permission by your teacher who recognizes your realization, and you can only teach practices that you have in turn received from another recognized teacher or lineage holder. And this kind of unbroken transmission, which in some cases purport to go all the way back to the historical Buddha, is central to notions of Buddhist authority, and lineage is the central factor in governing what is acceptable and what is not. An implication of this appeal to lineage is the central, or sorry, an implication of this appeal to lineage is that there's therefore very little room for innovation. Any kind of philosophical or practical practical innovation needs to be grounded in the lineage of the tradition for it to be institutionally legitimized. And kind of as a consequence of this, it must speak to the four noble truths that all Buddhism is directed towards, which is the reality of dukkha, this term meaning stress, dissatisfaction, or suffering, and the pursuit of its cessation, being nirvana. So using these two touchstones of what constitutes ethical use of indigenous plant medicines and how religious authority is understood in Buddhism, we can look at how Mike Crowley and Spring Washam fare under these lenses of analyses. So first, looking at Crowley's relationship with psychedelics in his work, it's clear that the practice he promotes is largely absent any engagement with indigenous communities. He exclusively uses the language of Western science, he presents psychedelics in a decontextualized way, and eschews all indigenous norms and understandings of plant medicine, at least in his written work. In his descriptions of ayahuasca, peyote, and psilocybin in the chapter, Psychedelic Drugs to Enhance Your Buddhist Practice, in this book, Psychedelic Buddhism, he references the chemical makeups and the Western communities that use these plant medicines and really only nods to the indigenous sources of these practice in a brief mention of the Native American church. Further, rather than look at how a psychedelic experience can connect one to the more than human world and heal self and, and society, as Salidwin suggests, Crowley writes that, quote, I would recommend that all Buddhists take at least one psychedelic trip in their life to check in with their Tathagata Garbha, or their Buddha nature, and to gauge their progress in meditation. And in doing so, he actively decontextualizes and somewhat instrumentalizes these plant medicines and presents them through an extractive lens. When we look at the sources that Crowley uses to inform his psychedelic practice, indigenous authorities, again, somewhat ignored in favor of allusions to the anarchist cookbook, Alan Watts, and websites like Erowid, which, while well, fine, don't recognize or affirm indigenous authority regarding this practice of plant medicine that he's kind of putting forth. Instead, Crowley employs this logic of bricolage that we find in a lot of spiritual but not religious and new age communities, of taking, of cutting, of pasting, of remixing, instead of a kind of collaborative methodology that we might expect in a more ethical approach to kind of indigenous relations. Uh, with respect to his relationship with indigenous Buddhisms, uh, Mike Crowley's Buddhist teaching is eclectic, but is perhaps a better example of positive indigenous relations. His book, Secret Drugs of Buddhism, writes the history or rewrites the history of Vajrayana Buddhism to always have been involved with psychedelics. And while I largely see the book as a work of eisegesis, where he reads his own meaning into these kind of historical materials, Crowley nonetheless displays an attention to indigenous Tibetan norms of authority and secrecy. In the preface, he writes, quote, be advised that this book does not divulge anything disclosed in any Vajrayana 
initiation under conditions of secrecy. In fact, I've received certain juicy tidbits in this manner, and I deeply regret that I may not share these with the general reader. And the footnote to this passage is maybe equally as frustrating. It reads, this does not apply to anyone who has received the appropriate initiations. Thus, should I meet anyone who has had the empowerment of, say, the Kaya Mandala of Chakrasamvara in the tradition of Luipa, a very interesting conversation might ensue. And I've received the empowerment of Chakrasamvara in a slightly different lineage. So if I ever come across Mike Crowley, like maybe I'll get some of those juicy tidbits and we'll, we'll have more conversations. But regardless, like despite maybe the frustration of this like subtle evidentiary claim or like hiding evidence, uh, there's a certain respect of traditional norms that this secrecy does indeed convey. So in a way, this kind of historical interpretation is in fact appealing to the norms of Tibetan Buddhist authority. Rather than present psychedelic Buddhism as a novel innovation, which would kind of go against the norms, Crowley grounds his syncretism in an inter interpretation of Buddhist history where Buddhists always did psychedelics. In an interview with Spirituality and Health, he was asked, how would you suggest Buddhists balance the fifth precept, which is this rule against taking intoxicants and experimenting with psychedelics? And he replied, quote, Prohibitions based on uh, prohibitions placed on psychedelics are the invention of modern teachers and have no basis in Buddhist history. In fact, psychedelics have a very definite place in Buddhist practice. So even if you may hold serious reservations about his historical conclusions in this book, which I personally do, um, he indeed appeals to the lineage of authority in his presentation of psychedelic Buddhism. That said, there are nonetheless moments that might give us pause in psychedelic Buddhism. For example, in his presentation of Buddhism for psychonauts, he details esoteric notions of the Buddha's body, Buddhist cosmology, and Tibetan edoms that you may encounter while tripping before he eventually gets to the foundational Four Noble Truths. So he, in his presentation of Buddhism for psychonauts, he kind of appeals to the sensationalist aspects of practice rather than the kind of foundational ethical principles, uh, which leaves something wanting in his particular portrayal of psychedelic Buddhism. But in Spring Washam's presentation of psychedelic Buddhism, we see perhaps a more robust engagement with indigeneity. Regarding plant medicine communities, Washam not only engages with psychedelics as plant medicines, but has herself trained in formal Shipibo settings. She therefore employs indigenous methodologies in her retreats. She acknowledges the source of this practice and hires indigenous facilitators to lead participants in their ayahuasca journeys. Many of her retreat materials also speak to the original contextualized use of ayahuasca as a modality for healing the self, community, and the more than human world. On an institutional level, Washam also prioritized the inclusion of BIPOC folks in her retreats and leads BIPOC only retreats for these communities to hold space for one another. She's in the process of releasing a documentary titled The Rising of a New Sun, wherein she shares the stories of black and indigenous folks working with ayahuasca, quote, as well as ancestral healing, dismantling internalized white supremacy, the legacy of colonization in our bodies, gender identity, patriarchy, and sexual orientation. So both practically and politically, Washam meets the majority of criteria for an ethical reconciliatory approach uh, to, the, to psychedelic use and the use of these indigenous plant medicines. In terms of Washam's relationship with the Buddhist tradition, there's a little bit of ambiguity. On the positive side, Washam centers the Four Noble Truths in her practice and views plant medicine as a tool to alleviate this central problem of dukkha, of stress, of unease in Buddhism. Further, she has permission from her teacher, Jack Cornfield, to build this syncretic approach to psychedelic Buddhism. Years ago, Cornfield was invited to give a talk on meditation and psychedelics at MAPS, but was unable to attend. And in his stead, he encouraged Washam to attend and give a talk on this intersection. And she's really been blazing this road ever since. So while perhaps not explicit, Washam's psychedelic Buddhism is indeed grounded in her lineage. Where the ambiguity arises is in Washam's approach to reconciling psychedelic use with the fifth Buddhist precept to abstain from intoxicants. She indeed recognizes that psychedelics may constitute a departure from classical Buddhist ethics, but sees this as a personal decision. Uh, in an interview with the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, um, she stated, the fifth precept is very important and everyone must decide for themselves based on their own intentions and motivations, what leads to heedlessness and what leads to healing. I realized right away that this was a powerful medicine, the exact opposite of an intoxicant. For me, there's therefore no tension between plant medicine and the fifth precept. So while there's perhaps a healthy amount of critical skepticism of tradition and innovation at work, Washam does indeed attend to the logics of the Buddhist tradition and grounds her psychedelic Buddhist syncretism in both the framework of the Four Noble Truths and the authority of her lineage. So as psychedelics become mainstreamed and the major world religions begin incorporating plant medicine into their religious practice, 
the indigenous roots cannot be left out of the picture. In the case of psychedelic Buddhism, we can see how Mike Crowley and Spring Washam intersect with indigenous communities in quite distinct ways, at times extractive, at times collaborative, at times respecting uh, the roots and the lineages of these practices, at times innovating and eschewing these traditional norms in their development of this syncretic religious practice. In these two models, we can therefore see both positives and negatives in the development of syncretic psychedelic religions that can not only allow us to better analyze these new religious movements, but allow us to reform the communities that we may be a part of. In order to avoid extractive modes of psychedelic use, we must center indigenous voices, histories, authority, and material reconciliation to help contextualize and ethically ground the use of these plant medicines. Likewise, I think we should pay attention to the logics of the religious traditions themselves and seek to appeal to these logics should we wish psychedelics be accepted as legitimate modes of religious practice. Given the speed at which psychedelics are being integrated into all facets of society, I expect that more psychedelic religious syncretisms will emerge across the world religions in very short time. And these psychedelic Buddhisms can be useful foils for thinking about how these future psychedelic religions might intersect with indigeneity in positive ways. Thank you. Next up is Alex Guerin, assistant professor in the Medical Ethics and Humanity, Humanities Unit at the University of Hong Kong, who will explore the importance of space and environment in shaping the mood and atmosphere within various psychedelic healing settings. Great. So thank you so much to the organizers, Jeffrey and Paul, for the invitation. Uh, it's been a great day, and I've uh, certainly learned a lot so far, and I um, hope you'll get something out of this talk. So today I'm going to present a, a kind of ethnographic exploration of what hopefully builds up towards a somewhat robust framework for studying the mood or the atmosphere of different settings of psychedelic healing. Now, we could understand atmosphere in, in its most simple sense as the feeling of a place or perhaps the feeling of a, um, a circumstance or even a person or an object can, can kind of emanate a certain atmosphere. Um, there are many angles to thinking about effective atmospheres or just or atmospheres, but I'm just going to begin with um, taking you on a visual journey through the setting and the environment of um, some ethnographic research I did in 2019 in the Peruvian Amazon. So I spent several months um, studying and living with uh, an indigenous family of healers that serviced um, international clients coming to drink ayahuasca at a temple called uh, Pachamama Temple. So they worked in collaboration with a European man. And was, at the time, they were one of the more popular um, ayahuasca retreats operating in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, but so we're looking now at the Malocca, the main Malocca, where people, where the clients would drink their ayahuasca. And you can see that it's a thatched roof. And there's, um, I would like to draw your attention to the um, paintings around the edges of the, the Malocca, where we see oil paintings of different deities from the world religions. Now, these were um, commissioned by the European um, co-owner of the retreat with a Quechuan-speaking mestizo um, artist um, named Ruvexen, who we'll come to in a moment. Um, but yeah, just to keep, keep that in mind. So here we are in this, this is the setting. Um, you can see it's just on the edge of the Yar Yarina Cocha Lagoon. So at, in the evenings, you would hear the symphony of zacatas and birds and, and um, the beautiful uh, ecology. It's kind of... I was doing research in, in winter, in the dry season, so that's also part of the atmosphere, you know. Drinking ayahuasca under a gi giant thunderstorm can certainly change the mood and feeling. So guests would uh, spend time in uh, hammocks between, between drinking sessions. So this is um, San Jose, just next to Yerina Cocha, um, where it's only a couple of hundred meters away from the retreat. In some evenings, you could hear reggaeton music coming from a distant um, party somewhere as we were waiting for the ayahuasca to kick in, and it's silent for 40 minutes. Um, 
One evening we, we could hear a, a preacher hectoring the community about the dangers of not following the path of Jesus. Um, that was a bit frustrating for some people. Um, so th this broader environment that the Shipibo live in and the healers inhabited, um, in 2019, prior to COVID, had about 50% unemployment, right? And it's subject to economic scarcity and ambient poverty. And so that's kind of part of the environment, and I'm going to argue part of the, the mood or the atmosphere of drinking in this session, in this place. Also nearby is the Yarina Kocha Lagoon, where the clients, we were the participants, we'd be taken on tours into the enchantment of the, the natural ecology. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, we would make our own ayahuasca with healers, eat traditional Shipibo food, um, do paint our visions with Ruvexen, the artist I mentioned before. And also on site at, at Pachamama Temple is a school that's led by um, Maestro Luis Pinito Vaquez. And every um, Sunday, kids from the neighborhood would come in and they'd learn about Shipibo history and Shipibo language. And so this would happen on retreat. So this is also kind of part of the atmosphere, you could say. And of course, the healers are a major agency in producing the atmosphere of, of, of a psychedelic session. Unique to Pachamama Temple is all of the healers come from one family. Um, so Rosa, Maestro Rosa, who's 76 years old at the time on the left here, she was kind of the mastermind behind this and she recruited her three sons, daughter, son-in-law and nephew that um, kind of serviced the, the, the clients who come in. Now drinking with a family is a, its own kind of atmosphere and I noted that some, some of the clients coming from, you know, the north, um, they found it really meaningful and, and healing to be around a functional and a family, especially if they came from a dysfunctional family. So, that, so that's kind of, you could consider that as part of the atmosphere. So now let me just um, tell an, an ethnographic story. So during the Peruvian winter, I sat on a worn single person mattress on the ground with a dozen international guests about to be served ayahuasca from the Shipibo healers. They entered the Moloka giggling and joking with, with each other, teasing their brother-in-law, generating a jovial ambience, as they typically did. A young man from England came up to me, moving carefully through the darkness, just before we were to drink ayahuasca. He arrived with vulnerability in his eyes. He asked if I, I could swap positions with him in the ceremony. The man wanted to change positions because he was located directly under a painting of Jesus. A bearded man, calm and serene, levitating on white and blue, blue light and emanating expressions of grace and love. The guest later told me that his upbringing in England had fostered a critical view of Christianity in him. He came to Peru to try to heal his depression and had just stopped taking SSRI medication, which he'd been using for over a decade. He seemed genuinely unsettled by the Jesus painting and later expressed worry that the image had negatively affected his ability to receive the Icaro songs from the healers in the previous ceremonies. Uh, where was I? And so when in his previous ceremonies, he was experiencing intense fear and haunting visions that caused him to vomit and, tr and tremble in quite a, a loud way. He, his expressions impacted the visionary experiences of those around him, creating a contagious mood that permeated the atmosphere. Ironically, I happened to be located underneath the dramatic painting of Kali, the Hindu goddess of war and destruction. Her image was intense, uh, expressing the shock and horror of pain and anger with a decapitated head and, as you can see, a skull, skull necklace. So while I, fi I found this very comical that, that this man preferred to journey under the watchful eye of a terrifying Hindu goddess as opposed to a loving depiction of Jesus, the example demonstrates the, the agency of materialities, objects and art within psychedelic atmospheres. So philosopher Hermann Schmitz developed an atmospheric theory of emotions to overcome what he saw as an enduring mistake in ancient Greek thought 
that defined emotions as located inside the person. He argued that by placing emotions solely in the interior of minds and bodies, they were placed closer to reason and thus more amenable to control. Now, this idea that emotions occur inside the person is pervasive in modern industrial societies, reproduced through popular psychology and other influences. A more accurate view, Schmitz suggested, is that emotions, whether anger, joy, or fear, are poured out into spaces, saturating objects and persons alike, generating distinct atmospheres. Ben Anderson extended such perspectives by suggesting that effective atmospheres are not reducible to the individual bodies that they emerge from, but are shaped by the human and non-human materialities and environments that surround bodies and that exert a force that breaks down and dissolves the subjective and the objective, the interior of the person and the exterior of their surroundings. Understanding effective atmospheres requires attending to their indeterminacy their so-called vagueness. They are not objects like cars, chairs, or white blood cells that can be measured in determinate ways, but they are singular, Anderson writes, in the sense of knowing the celebratory feeling of a birthday party, the collective sadness of a funeral, or the electric sensation just before a massive storm breaks. Anderson explored how effect affects are collective and transmitted between people and between people and environments and objects and non-human entities. Now, this theorization of effective atmospheres bears a wondrous similarity to descriptions of psychedelic phenomenology that emphasize boundary blurring between per the person and their surroundings, whether framed as ego dissolution, becoming one with the universe, or shape-shifting to the point of view of an animal or plant. Thus, along these lines, psychedelics are not just mood-enhancing or meaning-enhancing molecules, as defined by Ido Hartogson and others, but are atmosphere enhancers, manifestors, or openings, given their capacity to intensify sober kinds of effective atmospheres that already dissolve bodies and environments with feelings. Psychedelics can help to bring the atmosphere into the foreground, whereby it permeates the bodies of persons and is, and is permeated by them, connecting people to their environments and settings, sometimes in profound ways. This is why certain environments, sacred or special places, are sought after for their safety and healing properties or their cosmological properties. For instance, um, Rochelle Domitoff has done some great work in the 1970s and 80s on Tukanoan uses of yahe or ayahuasca in different environments. And um, I didn't get a chance to contact the Rochelle Dolmatov Foundation in Bogota to get permission to show you the images, but I encourage you to buy this book on the right um, to check out these images of all these different places where the Tucano would drink. One of the most sacred was is a place called Nyi, which is um, a, a boulder with petroglyphs on the side and shamans would drink yahe and use the hexagonal prism from the side of a tortoise to visualize the ecology around them and get in touch with what I would call place-based atmospheres. So psychedelics, uh, actually let's keep going. So before I went to Peru, I'd already done a really large ethnographic study for my PhD in Australia among neo-shamanic um, groups. And so when I arrived to Peru I, could, Peru, I could automatically sense how different the atmosphere was at the Shipibo-led ceremonies with their jovial and dramatic approach. And I, when Osiris began his talk, he, he spoke about this distinction between the sacred and, and the therapeutic and critiquing it, saying, actually, what about the jovial and playfulness and the silliness? And I, I recall Jonathan Ott, um, also discussing this, suggested that rather than the term recreational, perhaps we should use something like ludic or ludable to, to talk about those joyful and silly feelings that can erupt during um, psychedelic experiences. Um, so the Australian neo-shamanic ceremonies, by contrast, tended towards a more serious attitude, more ambient and consoling music, more comfortable materialities such as thick mattresses, pillows, hot water systems, ornamental rugs, Wi-Fi, and situated closer to home, both emotionally and physically. 
but also illegal, casting a secretive atmosphere across the evening. The palpable sense of difference in the ambience or atmosphere of ayahuasca ceremonies in these different contexts inspired me to try to pencil out an outline of psychedelic atmospherics or what psychedelics do to and reveal about effective atmospheres. So in the neo-shamanic Australian context, the ceremonies typically took place in nature, far away from urban areas, as participants believed cities posed spiritual and psychological risks to drinking ayahuasca. Some people shared stories of urban energies interfering with the healing of mother ayahuasca or leading to psycho-spiritual distress if they were drinking in the city, like in an apartment or in a... You know. Um, conversely, Mother Ayahuasca was also seen as a healer of urban ills, critiquing mainstream Australian life through her connection to, to nature. So it's a bit of a montage. Back, let's, let's flip back to in the Shipibo site in, that we were just discussing. There was always one healer who stayed in the middle of the Malocca to protect the healers and clients from external sorcery attacks. Compared to the wondrous and mystifying mood of the healing Icaros that maestros sung to the clients, the protector shaman songs in the middle of the ceremony were sometimes emotionally strained under the weight of competitive sorcery, expressing agony and triumph or relief, bringing local, local issues of urban politics, inequality and ambient poverty into the feeling of the ceremony space. The giant anaconda of one maestro lived under the Malocca and was summoned during ceremonies as a protector. While other maestros were visited by plant spirits and other allies that shaped their healing songs that are directed towards the guests. In, these, in this setting, these non-human persons are agents of healing and sorcery or protection that help to shape the atmosphere of the settings. So to conclude, here are what I suggest are kind of some of the main, what could be the main elements of a framework for studying psychedelic atmospherics or the, um, yeah, so let's go through them. So of course, it's the, the substance and the dose surely plays into the equation. You have a little bit, you have a lot, it can change the, the feeling. Um, second on the list would be the music and the sonic d dimensions. Are people chanting? Are they listening in, on their headphones? Um, you know, this morning, Lewis Eduardo Luna said that in, the, in Shipibo traditions, once the song is learned from the, from the plants, the song is the medicine and, and you don't necessarily need the plants anymore. So um, the music um, is a big part of it, clearly. Um, the guidance and, and care providers including their personality, their presence, their attitude, their charisma, um, you know. But, and also what if there is no guide and there is no hierarchy and it's a relation, everyone's on the same kind of level, what type of atmosphere difference could that make? Um, space and materialities. So let me look at this one. Yeah, so everything from the interior of the space, the altar, the mesa, the arrangement of bodies, is it a solo or a group session? The place and the environment, uh, the malocca, clinic, church, apartment. This morning, Candace Oglebsby said, t discussing the feeling, asking what, is, what does it feel like coming into a clinic, a space of, of privilege and power imbalance? So, you know, w w the architecture, but also the institutional um, kind of nature of these, these different spaces, what effects can they have on the atmosphere? Um, urban environments, natural environments, sacred sites. And then what about sociocultural and cosmological influences, the social expectations that people bring? I remember once speaking to some ayahuasca drinkers in Australia and they were imagining what if if Mother Ayahuasca was actually Father Ayahuasca. And some of them commented that, oh gosh, it'd just be too masculine and, 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 and thought that perhaps Mother Ayahuasca was present to try and kind of um, push down the intense um, masculine energy that some of the singers would, you know, play on their didgeridoo all night or bring a very masculine feeling into the, into the evening. 
um, assault, sorcery, ego dissolution. How do the how do non-human beings in, impact the the atmosphere? What about economic interactions? Um, the impact of the service economy on psychedelic moods. I've heard about these um, psychedelic retreats where you know you get offered these upsell. Uh, products or services on the way through where you can, you know, pay an extra $700 and have some 5-MEO. How does this, this kind of service economy play into the feeling? Or um, tourism and development. And of course, issues of class and in, the, in the super expensive retreats in Switzerland or that have just started in Australia, for example. What does it feel like to pay $25,000 and drink and to take some psilocybin? Finally, um, Emphasizing atmospheres influenced by political activism, peace building, like Leo Rossman's work in, um, in Israel and, and Palestine, or the de decolonial efforts. How, does, how can political um, life shape the atmosphere of a psychedelic session? So, and I just want to finish by saying, you know, some people I think would say, if you take a big enough dose, it doesn't matter where you are you'll end up in something like what the late Kalindi Lai called the interdimensional village. <laughs> this may be true, but the heroic doses of Terence McKenna and others are not for everyone. And in any case, the atmosphere may become even more important the stronger the dose and the more vulnerable, sensitive, and intense the experience. OK, thanks. Thank you. So our final speaker is Mason Marks, who's going to be joining us via Zoom. And so I think um, we have to uh, set up a, a different computer for that. Um, Mason is a medical doctor and law professor teaching psychedelic law at Harvard Law School and Florida State University. He will talk about the absence of indigenous peoples in the development of psychedelic regulations in the US and highlight how this can change in the future. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really want to thank the organizers for putting together such an incredible event and program. And I'm very sorry that I can't be with you uh, in person today. And despite uh, the scenery in the background, I, I unfortunately am not on vacation, but I'm happy to be able to, to jump on this call with you. So I am a law professor. I teach a course on psychedelic law. I, I also teach a more general course on drug law. And I'm going to talk a bit about the involvement of indigenous and religious communities in the lawmaking and rulemaking process. And, um, you know, it's, I, I'm not indigenous. And so um, I'm, I'm speaking about something that, you know, I don't have personal knowledge of. I've, I've been involved in the rulemaking process and I've spoken to indigenous communities in Oregon and Colorado, which are the two states that have uh, the psychedelic regulation that I'm going to talk about. And so I'll, I'll do my best to convey uh, what I've seen during these, these uh, lawmaking and rulemaking periods and what I've heard from indigenous people there, who of course are a select group. They don't represent um, all indigenous people. So I'm going to focus in on Oregon and Colorado. So I want to first start with Oregon's psilocybin law. Oregon was the first state to legalize the supervised use of psilocybin. That means the use of psilocybin uh, producing mushrooms or uh, extracts of psilocybin made from those mushrooms under the supervision of a trained and licensed individual called a facilitator. So this is supervised use. People cannot go to a dispensary and buy psilocybin and take it home and use it however they like. They have to use it under the supervision of these professionals who monitors them while they experience the effects. And voters in Oregon approved this law in November of 2020. It was called Measure 109. It was a ballot initiative approved by voters, also called the Oregon Psilocybin Services Act. Uh, that program, after its approval, entered a two-year rulemaking period, and then the industry opened for business to clients last summer and so at this point it's been open for about eight months or so and i would say roughly based on estimates about a thousand clients have been served in that program colorado is a couple of years behind oregon voters enacted a law uh, or a ballot initiative called proposition 122 
also called the Natural Medicine Health Act. It shares some similarities with Oregon's law, but it's also very different. I won't get into too many of the details of the differences right now, and I'll, I'll just focus on the, uh, uh, those that are related to religious use. But one of the key differences that is relevant, relevant is the fact that exactly while you know, Oregon's law regulates law psilocybin, law. psilocybin, Colorado's law will potentially regulate four psychedelic plants and fungi. So not just psilocybin, but also uh, iboga, which produces ibogaine and is used by people in uh, West Central Africa, like practitioners of the uh, Bowiti religion. Uh, it potentially will regulate um, ayahuasca and uh, mescaline from, uh, from non-peyote sources. So that's one really important thing to keep in mind is the fact that uh, Oregon is just psilocybin. Colorado is um, a whole handful of substances. So we're, we're talking about a much larger variety of indigenous communities and they're around the world. And something I'll come back to when it comes to the Colorado law is a, an amendment that the legislature made to the voter enacted ballot initiative. And this was last summer. And I, I'll call this the Fenberg amendment after its chief sponsor, Stephen Fenberg, who is the Senate president in Colorado. It's also called Senate Bill 290 or SB 290. So it amended the Natural Medicine Health Act enacted by voters. And I'll come back to that because it's very important. So these are the two laws I want to talk about, Oregon's Measure 109, Colorado's Proposition 122. The question is, how much involvement did indigenous and religious communities have in the creation of these laws and the rulemaking periods that followed? And before I answer that question, I want to talk a little bit about what happened to Native Americans in these two states and other states throughout the country. In Oregon, there were many Native tribes present prior to the arrival of European settlers. One community was the Klamath, who lived in southern Oregon. And they were eventually removed from their ancestral land because settlers of European descent wanted their land for farming. They were relocated to a heavily wooded area where they started their own uh, logging industry. And then later, the settlers of European descent wanted that land as well uh, and, and wanted that, that uh, land for, the, for its timber. And so there is a long history of violence taking and failing to honor the word of the government when agreements were made by the US government and not honored. So there is this long history that it's understandable uh, would generate a lot of distrust on, on the part of these communities. And, and it's a similar story in Colorado where uh, people like the Ute tribe were relocated. And in this case, it wasn't so much uh, uh, timber as it was mineral deposits that were, were desired. And so they were, the Utes were relocated to increasingly smaller settlements and eventually uh, entirely relocated to Utah. So just keep this background in mind as we consider whether and how much indigenous voices were included in the, the lawmaking and rulemaking processes. So going back to Oregon for a second, the law mentions indigenous communities very minimally. One way that it does this is through the uh, Psilocybin Advisory Board that was formed. And I served on that board for about a year before I moved out of the state to Florida. But I was a member of the, the you know, from the beginning. And um, of, the, of the seats allocated to that, that uh, 15 or so member board, one seat was reserved for a representative of one of Oregon's federally recognized tribes. But that seat went unfilled for about two years. Uh, by that time, the final rules had already been adopted. They did eventually fill that seat. One might question what Oregon's recognized tribes might have to say about psilocybin mushroom use. That's a legitimate question. That's typically associated with indigenous communities in Mexico rather than the United States or Oregon. Native American communities like the Klamath and the Utes in Colorado utilize peyote in ceremonial, for ceremonial purposes. Uh, but Oregon was regulating psilocybin, not peyote. So a little bit of a, a disconnect there. Still uh, certainly a reasonable thing to do 
to ask for the input of the of Oregon's federally recognized tribes. And uh, as far as I know, that was not done during the drafting of the law. And um, as I said, it uh, took years to fill that spot uh, on the advisory board. Colorado's law, um, as I said, it has a key difference in that it involves many more indigenous people around the world. And uh, I think I've probably attended most of the meetings of the Colorado Advisory Board, and there have been dozens. So we're talking uh, hundreds of hours. I've probably attended more than most people. I don't think I've ever heard uh, Bawiti mentioned. And um, the way that indigenous communities are mentioned in um, Colorado's law is primarily through the Fenberg Amendment. So this Senate Bill 290, which amended the voter enacted ballot initiative, it included some very powerful language right up at the top. So uh, right, right in big bold letters uh, at the very top, uh, Fenberg said that, quote, considerable, har considerable harm may occur to federally recognized American tribes and indigenous people, communities, cultures, and religions, end quote, if traditional use of psychedelics is misappropriated or exploited. Further, the legislator said, legislature said its intent was to, quote, ensure that the federally recognized American tribes and indigenous people, communities, cultures, and religions are honored and respected as the state legalizes and regulates natural medicine, end quote. So another, another reasonable question is to ask whether it's even possible to create a regulatory framework, a legal system that heavily regulates these sacred plants that are used by indigenous people around the world and, and honor and respect, respect those people and their traditions. Is, that, is it even possible to do that? Uh, one thing that the Fenberg Amendment did to attempt to achieve those goals is to require the formation of a working group of federally recognized American tribes and indigenous communities. And uh, at a public meeting in July, the primary state agency that oversees the implementation of Colorado's law said that it hoped to get this uh, indigenous working group up and running and unveiled in August. Uh, but now here we are six months later and that group has not been formed. Uh, it was just last month that the application to apply to be on that, that board was published. Uh, so just like in Oregon, how the seat remained unfilled for the uh, tribal representative, uh, uh, long after the initial rules were, were proposed, discussed, and adopted. The same has happened in Colorado because at the last monthly meeting of the uh, Colorado Natural Medicine Advisory Board, that board adopted its first round of rules. So they voted on the rules after lengthy discussion, and uh, that work group uh, is nowhere to be found. Now, one might question whether it would make any difference at all. And some of the indigenous people I've spoken to in Colorado are not convinced that it would. So they see that as um, sort of an afterthought, something that would be unlikely to uh, be listened to. And from their perspective, again, this is just some people that I've spoken to, they feel that the, the process of making Colorado's law left them entirely out of the process. They, they really were not consulted. Certainly their um, consent was not sought with respect to peyote. Uh, or, or mescaline in general. There are, are differing opinions about mescaline. Some uh, groups typically associated with the Native American church uh, advocate for uh, uh, leaving peyote out of these types of laws. There are other groups who would like to leave mescaline. Mescaline can be obtained from other cacti, like the San Pedro cactus. Uh, they would like to see other groups would like to see mescaline entirely out of these laws, whether from peyote or not. So there's, there's disagreement about these issues, uh, but we really don't hear about this, uh, these debates publicly uh, in public meetings of the board and, and of regulators. Another potentially concerning feature of the Fenberg Amendment was that it mentioned indigenous and religious use in the context of regulated, it's the regulated program. There's a whole other side to this law that I didn't mention, which decriminalizes substances for personal use. And um, 
prior to the, this amendment, there was no mention of religious or indigenous use in the regulated side where, where there are facilitators monitoring people. But the Fenberg Amendment introduced that, and it allowed people engaging in bona fide indigenous or religious practices to do so without obtaining a facilitator's license, provided they did not advertise, they didn't operate for profit, and that they disclosed that they were not licensed as facilitators. So this um, clause created a lot of problems because it put regulators and the advisory board in Colorado in the unenviable position of having to debate and decide what constitutes bona fide indigenous or religious use. And they have not been able to do that, which is not uh, too surprising. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. So there's been some debate uh, even among board members in Colorado about the meaning of that language, what, what is bona fide, and also the way that that language seems to treat uh, the licensed facilitators and indigenous practitioners sort of uh, as belonging to different tiers. Perhaps the indigenous users, uh, indigenous practitioners are not given the same amount of respect uh, and um, privileges as the licensed facilitators. So that has been a real uh, point of contention. So what is the moral of all this? I, I, I think um, what I really just want to leave you with is that for, in my experience and in talking to people who live in these states, they would like to see moving forward involvement of indigenous communities from the very beginning, uh, even before there's a draft of a law. Uh, and oftentimes these laws are drafted by uh, white cannabis business lawyers, and that, that is the, the demographic that drafts these laws. They might, um, at the last minute before the, the language is finalized, get someone who claims to represent indigenous communities to comment on that draft a week or two before it's turned in to the state. Um, but indigenous people I've spoken with say that that concerns them, and it reminds them of uh, colonial practices where Sometimes the US government might appoint someone as a representative for a tribe or may, maybe many tribes, get them to sign a piece of paper that was supposed to represent a treaty. And so uh, some indigenous people I've spoken with in Colorado feel that this is uh, uh, reflecting these uh, practices of the 19th century. So um, I think what I would like to see moving forward and what a lot of people would like to see moving forward is a, a term I really liked from one of the other presenters, which was robust engagement of indig indigeneity. But it has to happen from the beginning, uh, from step one, and not be uh, an afterthought, which it increasingly appears to be uh, for a variety of reasons. Thank you. LJ, there's a question back there. My question was for him as well, but I guess I could um, I could address it to other other um, speakers. Um, one of the things that is concerning for me is that those of us who want to build alliances with indigenous practitioners, um, I personally feel we're working uphill because we have already, as a culture, destroyed their trust, and there's no reason for them to want to work with us. Um, but I'm a member of the Board of um, Psychedelic Medicine and um, Therapies, and one of the things we're looking to do is create a licensing exam for licensed practitioners, but also provide a method or a vetting or a licensing exam for lineage and legacy practitioners in, uh, in a, a, a form to create a pathway for above ground work which I think is really important for this work to move forward in all its facets. And I, sitting here knowing the history of our country um, and how we do things, I don't see why they would want to work with us. And I'm wondering if anyone on the panel can have some insight or share how we can rebuild this relationship um, including my own lineage, how we can rebuild this relationship moving forward with trust if it's been so, so destroyed. Osiris, you want to take that? Yes, sure. Um, 
to, to face this, this question, for example, it's necessary to recognize the different cultural uses of psychedelics or intelligence and, and so on. And in order to build this trust, of course, this acknowledgement, it's um, a requirement, right? Also, um, now in the case of Mexico, there are, there are an initiative in the Senate House to reschedule psilocybin uh, mushrooms. And this uh, project, for example, um, considers the indigenous communities as a um, um, service, as a psilocybin or mushrooms, in, in the case of Mexico, providers, right? It's, a, it's an effort, for example, not only to include and to preserve, right, but also to give uh, recognition and reciprocity. For example, without indigenous peoples, for example, we are not be able to talk about clinical trials because indigenous peoples have been the keepers of this knowledge for centuries or uh, even millennia. And the first step is to recognize, for example, the value of indigenous knowledge, include indigenous scholars, because there are uh, plenty of indigenous scholars, and also um, develop a cross-cultural policy, cross-cultural psychiatry, or I notice a, a gap in the in the field regarding, for example, a cross-cultural psychedelic, psychedelic assisted therapy, right? Mm -hmm. And this is part of a broader scope that it's a, a cross-cultural democracy. <laughs> but this is not a conference on political science and so on, but it's, it's another step in order to develop a cross-cultural democracy to include uh, BIPOC, indigenous people, people of colors, mestizo, Latino, and so on. One of the first steps is to move forward through um, cross-cultural psychedelic assisted therapy, for example, take into account the knowledge of indigenous peoples. I would also like to add that um, while indigenous people may not want to be involved, we should not assume that, right? I think that we should make every possible effort to make the call for their participation, every effort um, to invite, every effort to speak about and document what the collaboration looks like, what the benefit sharing looks like. And so I would prefer that we maintain a positive outlook. Um, but yes, we approach this, even myself, uh, living outside of my community, you have to approach it with humility um, and, and you know, with a lot of positivity, knowing that um, it may be challenging. But I think that there is a lot of room also, at least among the Massatec, to learn about integration, which is not a core piece of our practice. And I think it is, it is something that the Massatec can learn about. So I see a future where um, uh, medical uh, doctors uh, here are uh, in Mexico, in Huautla de Jimenez, Oaxaca, talking with practitioners there and sharing expertise and collaboratively thinking about a better future. On that note, there's coffee outside and our next panel is at 4 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2024, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.